is the second installment of our Love for the Truth Bible Study series. And we covered some of the preliminaries and the fundamentals in the first lesson. And we're going to move on here with another lesson along the same line, but ask a few questions as we look into the scriptures together and come to a logical and reasonable conclusion why man's able to do what God has told him to do. And all this myth about sin nature and Romans 5.12 and Psalm 51.5 and all this other nonsense, which we'll cover in our lessons. Don't worry, we'll, we'll get to each and every one of those and why so many people are deceived. So if you want to click up the whole series, you can just click on my Holding Firmly name and it'll go to my particular channel on YouTube and there you'll have the playlist. And you can click on the playlist and then they'll play sequentially. And this is the second installment, so there'll only be two there and probably for a while until we make some more studies. What we're going to look at here is why won't they repent? If anybody's read my material and visited my website and heard, heard me in the past, we talk about this a lot. Because of the substitution replacement theology, there is this attitude in the professed Christianity that there's really nothing to repent of because they're all under the blood and everybody sins everybody, nobody's righteous, it's not of works. See, with a major obstacle, as I show in my study, again, you can, you can get this off the site in the PDF form. And another major obstacle is that the, the straw man scenario is they'll present it this way. They'll say, well, God demands absolute perfection. Well, man falls far short of the absolute perfection. Filthy rags. So Jesus came as his replacement to fulfill all that perfection and righteousness. And by trusting in him, then, we have this transfer of virtue, transfer of obedience or imputed righteousness, if you want to call it the theological name. So that's another major obstacle, is this straw man idea that no one's righteous, all have sinned. You see, when they say no one's righteous, they mean no one has ever been righteous, ever will be righteous, in or out of Christ. It makes no difference whatsoever. So he who does what is right is righteous, and he who sins is of the devil. It means really nothing to them people. It's just another self-righteousness. Because to them, every effort they put forth is filthy rags. So they have nothing to repent of. It's already under the blood when they receive Jesus by repeating some words or trusting in the, him as his personal savior or however routine that they, they came under. There's, what, do you, what do you repent of? You repent every day. That's what a lot of people say. We repent every day. Sin confess. First John 1, 8 and 9. If I say I have no sin, I'm a liar. Well, if I say that, that uh, I'm not sinning now presently and there's not sin dwelling in me all the time, well, then there's no truth in me. But if I confess that, then he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Well, in other words, what you're saying, you're saying the blood has you covered is what you're saying. You're, you're under the blood while you're in the actual commission of sin. As you continue to, in your sin, as they occur... You confess them, which I don't think too many people are too accurate with that because sin hardens the heart, folks. And then the blood has you covered. So nothing to repent of. It's, of course, it's not a works. Deeds worthy of repentance would be a work. Putting forth any effort would be a work. That'd be deemed unnecessary under their fallacies, or not, even, not only unnecessary, but trying to save yourself so it's he that worketh not, but believeth in him that justifieth the ungodly. He is the one that's saved. See, to them, he that worketh not. Again, the straw man that it's not of works means not even of a faithfulness to God. See, the, 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 law, the law of sin and death was replaced by the law of faith. Well, what's the law of faith? The law of faith is faithfulness and fidelity. See, it says in Romans 3.27. That's why in, in a couple of verses later, in verse 31, it talks about the faith upholding and establishing the law. Do we make void the law through faith? Well, God forbid we establish it. Well, why? Because it's faithfulness to God that came to him for reconciliation on his terms, in repentance and faith proven by deeds, was reconciled through that to the mercy seat, had the blood sprinkled, 
purged from his conscience, purged from his purged from his life, the release from bondage has taken place. And that's the person that's walking with Christ. So nothing there's nothing to repent of, then it's not of works, because any effort you put forth, well that would be that would be a work. So therefore it's not necessary. In most, and in most instances, the people are preaching, well, you're saved by faith alone, by trusting in the finished work of Christ. He paid everything in advance. Past, present, and future sins are forgiven. So who's going to put forth any effort when they receive this package or this arrangement that is supposedly laid down by all these preachers? Because the moral to the story is always, Jesus did it for you. See, that's the reason focus groups and 12-step programs do nothing but magnify the false gospel. You see what I'm saying? It's, you think that, well, that, well, at least they're getting there and they're talking about their problems and their addictions. No, all it does is magnify the false gospel that you're saved in your sins anyway instead of the necessity of coming out of them because you will not inherit the kingdom if you continue in them. So you're saved under those things. Well, there's really nothing to repent of. So that's part of the reason why people won't repent. They just have a complete misunderstanding of the scriptures. And they trust in faith alone, or the faith of devils. The scripture says, though, however, in Isaiah 55, the scripture that you've probably heard, Seek the Lord while he may be found, and call upon him while he was near. And let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, and he will abundantly pardon. Well, in this, see, he's talking, to, he's talking to the people. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Come, let us reason together. The reasonable service to present your body a living sacrifice. All tying together in the scriptures to seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. He has called all men everywhere to repent. He's convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. His hand is outstretched. So you call upon him while he was near, but the necessity is let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and then return to the Lord and then he will have mercy on him. You see the same thing throughout the theme throughout the scriptures. First lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Then receive with meekness the implanted word. So you can't be saved in your sins in the sense that while you're still committing them, that they're covered magically by the blood. That's what people have been taught. It does not work that way. See, not of works least anyone should boast. The boasting spoken of in Romans, in that Ephesians passage, is the boast that the religious people were making that they could be justified of their willful transgressions by the law, by rituals and sacrifices. And there was no ritual and sacrifice that could remit willful sin. Willful sin was death. The rituals and sacrifice system that was set up in the book of Exodus and Moses was for unintentional sins, non-presumptuous sins. When you messed up a sacrifice, you messed up a washing or something, you forgot to do something on the Sabbath, that type of thing. Willful sins, you, no, there, was no, there was no reprieve. Testimony of two or three witnesses, you were put to death. So therefore, that, that sacrificial system that the Jews were trusting in, the, relig the religious elites of the time, thinking they could be justified by obedience to the law or to the Talmud, that they created all these laws, the washings and the rituals and the ceremonies. They were boasting in that, that instead of the righteousness of faith that upholds and establishes the law because it loves God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You see the difference there? It's not a boast pound in your chest. Well, here I am, Lord. I'm presenting myself to you. I'm a vessel fit for the master's use. No, it wasn't. It, it, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a faithfulness that came to God and for reconciliation in broken repentance. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. As the scriptures we, we covered in the first lesson. This is the process of repentance. 
And I can't lay it out one, two, three for every person on the planet that wants to come to God. You have to use your own logic. Then That's why the Lord says, Come and let us reason together, saith the Lord. See, come and reason with Him, not with me. I can only show you what the Scriptures teach. Let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Return to the Lord, and then the Lord can abundantly pardon. That's the promise in the Scriptures. Why haven't the burden been lifted off your, off your soul yet? You still feel the condemnation of your sins, the guilt? And the condemnation hanging over you like a cloud? Well, there's still some kind of a deceit and ulterior motive. See, blessed is the man in, in whose heart there is no guile. That's the part they miss in Romans chapter 4, when they get to the he that worketh not, in verse 4 and 5. Well, David was talking about a man that emptied his heart of God with himself in Psalm 32. So, blessed is the man that's emptied himself of treachery and deceit, and come to the Lord on his face, seeking reconciliation. Not expecting anything, because, oh, I'm a vessel now, fit for your use. No, but presenting yourself a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to him, which is reasonable, agreeable with reason and logic. That's what it means when you're talking about reasoning with God, because man has a reasoning intellect and ability to reason with God. He's been stripped of that by this phony theology. So accordingly, then, if you pull away all the straw mans, you can see in the scriptures what happens in this repentance. Like Romans 6, 4, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So how can you, who have been died to sin, live any longer therein, it goes on to say. See, because he's saying, in the past, was crucified. Galatians 5, 24, those who are in Christ have crucified. Past tense. These are clearly in the past tense which is called the aorist tense in the Greek, which there's no equivalent in the English, because it's talking about an action that has taken place in the past, not to be repeated. That's why he said, crucifying him of flesh when you trample the blood, when you insult the spirit of grace, and hold it up for open shame. That's the reason for those Hebrews scriptures, because this was something that was supposed to occur in repentance, not a penance like the Catholic Church turned it into, or what your modern theologians look at the church, what they call the church fathers, the second, third century guys that understood repentance very clearly, you see from their remarks, and the free will of man, in the Gnostic, uh, deadly Gnostic error of dual nature. But they call them guys, well see they were Catholics, they were, they were preaching penance. Well, no, you're preaching lawlessness, so to them, demanding deeds worthy of repentance and a vessel fit for the master's use, come, coming out of repentance, scrubbed, clean, cast out of doors, a vessel ready for the indwelling of the Spirit, to you, that's heresy, that, that's penance. But they're not saying it, that you went continually to the confessional, but you continually confessed your sins to the priest so you could have penance. No, we're talking about repentance which is put to death, once and for all, dead to sin. So if that's happened, then how if you have died to sin, how can you live any longer therein? So who you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether it's sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you obeyed from your heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, having been set free from sin, put to death in repentance, become slaves or servants of righteousness. 